I'm standing in front of a Shop Sabre Pro 408, which happens to be one of my very favorite CNC routers. Now you'll notice something unusual on this machine, and we have a special setup for the machine. Now we get a lot of requests around here about different kinds of projects to do for videos, but one of the things that pops up the most now are furniture parts. People say, we know how to make cabinet parts, we want to make furniture parts. That's what we're going to do in this machine, and I think you're going to be really excited about it. Now, let's look at that setup. All right, on the machine we actually have a fourth axis system installed, and I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit. What this does is it adds a lot of capability to your machine. Of course, the machine axis are X, Y, and Z, and this adds a rotary axis, and it happens to be A. And the machine control can actually handle a move that has moves in all four of those axes. So it's called fourth axis simultaneous. Now the heart of this is actually the chuck, and this is a machine tool chuck. It's a four jaw chuck, and here's what the benefit of that is. It's real easy to clamp square stock, rectangular stock, or unusually shaped pieces. So that works out real good. What makes it actually turn, though, is a belt drive system. You say, well, what good is that? Well, a belt drive system has no backlash. So that means I don't have to worry about uh, gears meshing and, and play coming inside of that. It also allows me, because it's a belt drive, I can actually spin that at a constant RPM if I wanted to. Now let's look a little bit at the kind of parts we might make with an attachment like this. All right, let's talk about the kinds of parts that you might make on a fourth axis system. Probably the most common would be a gun stock. Well, you say, why a gun stock? Well, think about how you make one, how you machine a gun stock. There's basically a tool pass coming in from a lot of different directions, and a fourth axis system is a real good way to make that. To make that on a three axis takes a whole lot of fixturing to hold the, the stock in place. Another really good application might be a turning. You know, not just turnings you can make on a lathe, but turnings that have decorative stuff, acanthus leaves and all kinds of unusual stuff like that, really high value parts are great applications for this. You know, you may have a part that you can't hold any other way, but you can hold it between centers and, and machine it that way. So those are all good applications. Now, one of the things that you have to consider when you go to fourth axis is the part you're going to make and how it fits on the machine. Now I selected the Pro 408 because of the gantry height. I knew I was going to have to have that much clearance to make this part. Now we offer this fourth axis system on virtually all the CNC router models that we offer. Once again, be sure that the part you want to make fits under the gantry. Now you know I get asked a whole lot about requests about what to make in these demos. And boy, it just keeps coming back. We don't want to see any more cabinet parts. We want to see a 3D furniture part. So I decided for this video we were going to do something really neat. If you notice in the system, I have a blank already chucked in here. Well, this is, this is what the blank looks like right here. Now, hiding inside of this blank is a cabriole leg. And so hopefully when we get finished with this uh, video, uh, we'll have a cabriole leg to show you. Our first step is to go in and look at the software, and I'll, I'll show you how we get started with the machine. Let's go into the front office. Before we look at the software, let me tell you a little bit about why I selected this project, this cabriole leg. Well, for one thing, I was looking for a complex 3D product that's really hard to make by hand. And I also always liked Queen Anne furniture, and way before CNC's I used to make it. So I've made some of these cabriole legs and I understand what goes into it. So that's why I basically selected this product. Now the way I started was I actually found on the internet um, an actually 3D model of a cabriole leg and let me show you what that looks like. Okay, this is the actual model of the Queen Anne leg that I found and, and I really liked it. The proportion's nice. Uh, it's probably been scanned off of a, an existing object. Uh, but here's the problem with that. Now I can, I can tool path that and make it, but I'm pretty much limited to, uh, uh, to what I can actually do. Now it happens to be a, an STL which is mesh. Now when you don't render it, this is what it looks like. Uh, that's what it looks like. So it's, it's basically when you get up real close, it's a bunch of tiny little triangles. So there's not any vectors on there. Now, I can actually go into the software and get edges and stuff like that or outlines. And so I decided what made more sense was to take the geometry and then create a solid model based on the geometry of, of, of this STL itself. And so that way, that gives me the ability to create a, a group of legs that all have the same style. So I could have one of these for a chair, one for an end table, one for a dining table. 
So basically, it, it just made more sense to, to, to create a solid model that then I could adapt to other things. Now let's take a look at how that came out. All right, what you see on the screen here is the actual 3D model. This was actually created in Rhino, and it's rendered right now, so it really looks nice. But if, if we go back to more of a shaded view, you can see it's basically a, a, a 3D model, so it's not, it's not meshes. Now, this down here looks like meshes, but it's just because there's so much geometry there. But it's really, it's a model also. So that's basically um, what ended up. So I started out with, with something that I found that I really liked the proportion design. And I basically stripped the geometry off that, and then used that to create this 3D model. So I, I was real pleased with how this came out. Now, now let's look at how do you go from this to making something on the machine. Okay, now the next step in this operation is a blank. In other words, how, how do we get this to the machine? So let's do this first. Let's actually turn on a ghosted view, and then let's turn the blank on. Now you can see how the part's actually positioned in there. So this blank is right here. This is the blank, and it, this is what we had on the machine, and so that cabriole leg is hiding in there, and that's what determines where it is. All right, so that's how, that's how we make the connection between the model and the machine itself. Now let's take a look at the actual tool paths that create the final shape. Let's talk now about how we actually machine this. We're using a product called RhinoCam to generate the machine code and the tool paths. It's actually a plugin that runs inside of Rhino and it's produced by Mexoff Corporation, and it's really, really powerful, and it's pretty easy to use. Now, you think about what has to happen here. We've got to get, the first thing we really want to do is get rid of as much material as we can, and those are called roughing passes, and what we do is we get rid of the material. We don't really care what the edge surface looks like, and we try to leave a certain amount of material on the model itself, and I think I have it set where it leaves an eighth of an inch. Now what happens is, you know, we, we, as we look at these tool paths, you'll see we'll come in from one side or the other. I think in this whole project, we actually attack the model from six different directions. All right now, let's look at the first roughing. So I'll just click on these and you should be able to see those. Okay, so that's how it first gets attacked. And basically what we're doing is we're just going in layers, we're taking off a certain amount per pass. Okay, then we rotate it to another edge and we do the same thing. All right, and we keep rotating. So we've rotated it three times, and, and once we've done this, we basically have the rough model, so it's roughed out. Now, all we have to do once you get the rough model is then start doing the finished tool pass. So the easiest thing to do is actually figure out, well, you know, what do you, what do you want to attack first? Now, one of the things that I did here, for instance, this is a profiling cut, and actually, this actually cut a, an area up at the end so that it's recessed, so in the blank itself, I can actually, in fact, if if I turn these plugs on, you'll see how this is held in place. So I added these, these are called, I call them plugs on the model, so that I have a, a way to clamp it in the machine. So basically this first pass just created a cut, uh, a cut across here, and that's just a guide for in the end when I trim it. Okay, same thing here, then we do a profile, while we had the same tool loaded, then we came over here and that cuts that out. All right, then you go, you rotate to the other side, once again, different angle, same process, Right here, same thing. So, so we methodically go through each of those surfaces and figure out wh how we're going to attack it. Okay, then we rotate here. This is very interesting because basically the cutter goes down through here and it creates that flat surface and then it flattens this out. So what we're actually doing is creating these flat planes inside of the leg. And then this pocket, while we're attacking from that same direction, we did that. So that's all in, it, from one direction, okay? And then we did the same thing over on this side. So we, we really trimmed the top of that. That's called an ear, all right? And then there's that flat, and then there's our pocketing, all right? So that took care of that. Then we rotate here, we rotated that, and now, what we did was we actually created, it's a pocket, it's really what it is, but we machined that flat so that that's a nice flat surface. So we keep going down through here. Now we get into 3D surfaces. So what we did this time, all right, let's see if we can move that over where you can see a little better. Okay, the tool is basically going back and forth. Now this tool happens to be a, a Vortex 2215. Now in layman's terms, it's a tapered bit. It's, a, it's an eighth inch ball nose that tapers up to about a quarter of an inch. 
I like it because they're really hard to break. Normally, smaller diameter tools are fragile, but the tapered ones are not. And so basically, it goes back and forth, and then it moves over a certain amount. That's called a step over. And the step over typically on that tool is going to be 10%, and it leaves a really smooth surface. So it just goes back and forth. Now, the reason I use that smaller tool is this area right here. In fact, let's look at that from a render standpoint. You see there's a square corner in here, and so the larger tool is always going to leave a radius. So in here I basically use an eighth inch diameter tool so I get a nice radius. Okay, as we rotate around here, you'll also see there's the same thing on this edge. So now those are the finished passes for up here, so those are the, the completed surfaces. Okay, now this area down here, is, as we get on down the leg, is, is a little more interesting. All right, we're using another system here, and there's how that one gets cut. Now we're attacking that at 45 degrees and tool pathing that, and then we're rotating it over and doing the same side over here. So that gives us the definition of the lower part of the leg. That works out really well, too. All right, then finally, let's go down here to the end. And we go down to the end. Let's see if we can't get that on the screen a little better. Now, th this is an interesting setup because basically what happens is the tool just goes back and forth, and then it rotates, and it steps over. And after it rotates 360 degrees, that's totally defined. And we can do that because that, that area is pretty concentric, so that made a lot of sense to do that. Now, there's a couple other things that I wanted to do while I had this set up, and one was, uh, this actually has, let's bring this back here where you can see it. If you notice on, the, on a leg like that, a lot of times you have mortises in there, and those, those are part of a mortise and tenon joint, and the mortise basically is cut in there, so it, it just makes sense because we have a fourth axis machine that we can actually position that and machine that. So we did that, and we did the same thing here. So we did all that on the machine. Let's see if we can get that where you can see it better. Right? And then we have we have this one. There's actually an area right down here that's a surface. So we basically use the ball tool to create that. And those are the tool paths that are required to machine that. Now, let's take those tool paths, let's take our blank, let's go out to the machine, and let's see if we can't make this part. Okay, we've got all our tool pathing completed. Our machine's set up, let's make a cabriole leg.
All right, our leg came out really, really nice. You know, there are lots of operations uh, to making a cabriole leg. Imagine if you had to do that by hand. Let me take the leg off here so we can look at it a little bit closer and see some of the details. Well, our leg came out really, really good. It's just amazing to me the detail this has, and, and, and we did it all with the machine. You know, we started out and we said, you know, we've got a leg like this hiding in a, in a blank, and lo and behold, that's how it came out. It's really, it's really a great way to make really complex furniture parts. Well, I hope you liked the video. We had a blast putting it together. If you have any questions, you can contact us at www.shopsaber.com. Thank you for watching.